Operation Confidence proudly presents America's Invisible Heroes Radio Talk Show. Tune in weekly on Sundays from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Pacific Time with your host, Consuela Mackey, co-host, U.S. Air Force veteran, Matt Davidson, announcers, Taylor Marcella and Brooke Gadesi, U.S. Army veteran and entertainment host, Charles Whitehead, U.S. Army Special Forces veteran, and I once was whole, segment host, Richard Cook. U.S. Army veteran and lifeline for women's veterans, segment host, Martha Elena Varela. National Faith Program Director and Veterans in Recovery, segment host, Anthony Akimpora. And U.S. Air Force veteran and incarceration to success, segment host, Kevin Lewandowski. For more information or to be a guest on our show, email info at operationconfidence.org. Okay, well, let's start. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to Americans Invisible Heroes. This show is dedicated to our veterans and their families. Yes, I'm your host, Consuela Mackey, Executive Director of a grassroots nonprofit organization called Operation Confidence. Many of you know that I'm not a veteran. But my heart goes out to our American heroes, especially those who are disabled and have experienced homelessness. For those who are new to the show, American Invisible Heroes was established to provide a platform for veterans to be able to share their experiences, accomplishments, heartfelt stories, resources, and more. Now, before we get started, I would like for all of us to acknowledge that Friday the 11th, as we all know, was Veterans Day. And we take this time to honor our vets who sacrificed so much for our freedom. We would also like to honor the Marine Corps, which was founded on November the 10th, I mean, 1777. We think all of our servicemen are just absolutely amazing. And women, of course. Now, allow me to introduce our co-hosts. Today, we have Taylor Marcella. She's one of Operation Conference's board members and an announcer. We have U.S. Army veteran Martha Varela. She's also an announcer, and she has a bi-monthly segment called Life Line for Women Veterans. And also, she's on our advisory board. Then we have Ann Monique. She has a bi-monthly segment. She's called The Rosie's Movement. Then we have U.S. Army Special Forces veteran Richard Cook. He has a bi-monthly segment called I Once Was Whole. And then last but not least, we have today is U.S. Army veteran Dr. Wendy, Wendy Children. She has a bi-monthly segment called Living Life Completely. Welcome, everyone. Doc, Dr. Children, we're going to turn it over to you, girlfriend. You have a few words of of uh, faith to give us today. Yes, I will open up. I'd just like to open up with a prayer. Uh, and I don't wanna say especially for, but we wanna lift up Charles Whitehead whose mother passed. And we just wanna take this time. I wanna take some time to honor him as well. So if you would, dear heavenly father, we thank you for this day. We ask that you just be with our brother Charles as he navigates the passing of his mother. Lord, we ask that you be with his family and comfort them. But Father, we also ask that they are able to rejoice in all the years that they had, their mom or grandma, aunt or sister, Lord. We ask that you would help them to focus on all of the positivity and all of the good times. Father, in addition, we just lift up all the veterans that have served and have given their lives and those that are still serving this country, Lord. We ask that you would be with them and comfort them as well. We ask for your guidance and for those that will come alongside Connie in this mission you have given her, this vision you've given her to help her carry out the work. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. 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 Amen.
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You're right on time. You're welcome. Okay. So I know that you have a heavy day today, Dr. Chilby, but I thank you so much for stopping in and giving that prayer to Charles and our veterans. And, you know, we just love you so much. And we'll see you back next week, right? Next week. Yes. Love you all as well. Thank you. You're God welcome. Bless. Bye. Okay, uh, before we get started, I want to uh, say happy birthday, Martha. If you thought we forgot you, girlfriend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and ironically, her birthday is on Veterans Day, so she's a veteran you. baby. Right. So we're going to let Ann take it away for right now, and then we're going to uh, move on to Martha's presentation. Take it away, Ann. Okay. Um, first of all, let me say that um, in the many, many months that I've been involved here with Operation Confidence, um, we have been so really pleased that you are in another part of the country than we've been working in very much, and that makes us more inclusive. You also have a very diverse group and that makes us more inclusive. And so in many ways you're validating just by being who you are, what we're trying to accomplish in this new type of social movement or national movement. It looks like uh, my uh, you have disabled my screen sharing. Can you check on that? It Can says, you do uh, that, uh, Taylor? It says uh, the host is disabled. I think you have to do that, Connie. Well, I didn't disable it. I think you can just go to share to make you a host, though, right? It says yeah. the host disabled. Co host, I'm sorry. Co host, mm -hmm. and you'll go from there. Okay, you're all a co host now. Mm -hmm. you just tell me when you're ready. You're, I'm ready. Okay, very good. Um, we're go I'm going to go ahead and give you um, essentially um, a PowerPoint presentation as much as I feel that many times PowerPoint presentations are very much pushing information at your audience and not getting audience participation. But um, in the interest of time, and we don't have that much time today, I'll go ahead with a PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. I didn't realize that. First of all, I want you to see that this logo, we, this is the famous logo, but it has problems because it's been used by many, many uh, corporations and everything from cleaning agents to women's underwear to whatever. And so it's lost its power uh, to express in an in-depth way what we're really all about. And, um, but this is the, uh, that photograph there is pretty much the, the image that people have uh, accepted. Um, and um, so we, we just keep using that. Although I may ask for your help here in the latter part of this presentation to think about uh, doing it another way. I want you to know the mission of our organization. Our organization is called Thanks Plain and Simple. Um, our mission is to create projects that need to be done in America and do such a good job that others join in. And of course, we include veterans when possible, which is part of our IRS uh, mission statement. If you look at that, to create projects that need to be done in America and do such a good job that others join in, it means you're doing something that nobody else is doing in the way that you feel should be done. And it also is in a way that invites people to join in, the people meaning uh, all Americans. Um, the American Rosie Movement uh, has uh, many benefits to Americans, I mean, to veterans and their communities. And I want to explain 
to the to you how we feel that they do, or that what we're essentially attempting to do. Uh, now we really believe that Operation Confidence is leading the way for veterans to help Americans to pull together. We know that we've only known each other for a little more than a year, but we have a solid relationship, and you all are meeting our standards um, um, very, very well and very happily. And that's you know, the tone is good, and the work is excellent. Thank you. Um, so how are you showing that you have a peace in the American Rosie movement? This peace in the American Rosie movement is very important because what we're saying is people don't have to do a huge amount of work or a big project or uh, something uh, nationwide in order to be part of the movement that you all are uh, growing, of course, in the size of the peace that you're making for a movement that is um, going to be essentially not only known in America, but it's already being known internationally. So one of the things you've done is ring a bell for the Rosies. I love these pictures. Uh, there's one of them in here that's, uh, I believe that's Richards. No, it's- It's here. everyone. Well, um, we had yeah, several. Sure which, one, which one was right? Oh, yeah, there, there's a few others that- Anyway, uh, the, the bell ringing is very important because it's an announcement that a project is being done or that people are essentially joining together. And uh, it's a happy thing. And one of the reasons we call this the American Rosie Movement is most of the women were not riveters. Therefore, uh, it has kept a lot of women from coming forward that should have been honored. So we just say the American Rosie Movement. But another reason is that it is rosy. It's, it's a happy movement, not that there isn't hard work to it. But um, with, we, with the um, very good help that you've given us, uh, we are very sure that we're gonna go forward in a, in a bigger way. You've interviewed Rosie's. Um, this is Ruth Edwards. You never saw this video and I'm gonna play this for you today. Okay, we Excuse love Ruth. Uh, Ruth died. Um, uh -huh. She died just before her 100th birthday. Her birthday would have been in October and she died about six weeks ahead of time. Now I'm going to I'm going to move this thing forward in the interest of time. If there's a Pokemon hiding in the halls of Friends Home West, Ruth Edwards will find it. She loves adventure. A trait she, she was 99 then, right? It didn't hear you. She was 99 years old with her cell phone. Yes, that's right. A little town, about a thousand people. And I graduated from high school there with Chuck Yeager, who is now a retired Brigadier General. I said if I had any claim to fame, it would be the fact that I had graduated with Chuck Yeager. Chuck Yeager, known as the fastest man alive, was the first person to break the sound barrier. He was also Ruth Edwards' boyfriend. In her 96 years, she's never been afraid to try something new. Today, she's catching Pikachu. But more than 70 years ago, she was working in a steel manufacturing plant. Ruth was a Rosie. Carnegie, Illinois Steel from Pennsylvania came into South Charleston and set up a plant in the U.S. Naval Ordnance Plant. So I went up there. Now that's very close shop. to where I live right now. We made uh, armor plates and gun barrels and uh, missiles, types of missiles and uh, things for battleships, parts for battleships. World War II was underway. Many men who worked in the factories were fighting overseas and women stepped up to help. Those women later became known as Rosie like Rosie the Riveter. I was about 20 years old at the time, and I, I had never seen anything like that. That machine shop was, it was huge. It had all kinds of drill presses, milling machines, all kinds of just rows and rows of, of machines. My job was expediter, which was going from machine to machine, uh, checking at night to make sure that they had all the equipment that they needed, and uh, there were no cell phones, no, we were, we were the communications link between management and, and production. 
Ruth didn't have experience, but she had drive. We went to work because we wanted to end the war as quickly as we could. I don't think anybody missed a shift. There was no absenteeism and no vacations. And everyone was patriotic. We went to work because we wanted to end the war as quickly as we could. And when the men left to go to war, that left the defense plants without enough workers. So the women came out of the kitchens, they said, and went to work in plants. She remembers the first time she saw this iconic image. It sort of indicates that, you know, their strength and unity. And the women united to work to, to try to help end the war. So it's, uh, it, it just became a, a symbol for everybody. That red bandana and that we can do it. <laughs> the women did it, working right up to the end of the war. I worked until the day uh, peace was declared. And uh, when that happened, Carnegie Steel pulled out of the Naval Ordnance Plant, went back to Pennsylvania, and they, everything stopped right then. It was just, they left all their equipment there, all the machines were left there. So they were stored in what later became the stamping plant in South Charleston, West Virginia. So when the Today Show, wanted to uh, uh, do a, a program on the Rosies. So when they came into Charleston to do that, all they had to do was to get those machines dusted and cleaned up. And they had the, the show right there in the plant that I worked in. Wow. She had friends on the front lines and one special man in her heart whom she didn't know if she would ever see again. So at one time he was reported killed and then another time he was was reported missing. So then I found out that he was a Japanese, that he did, uh, was on the Baton Death March. He was on Baton, was on the Baton Death March and was being held as a prisoner of war. James Harold Edwards. But he was in about three or four camps, prison camps in that area. And, and he was transferred to uh, Tokyo, Japan and worked in copper mines forced to work in copper mines that his uh got down to set i think it was 76 pounds so he was put in what they call the death house and that was where they put you when you weren't going to live so they just gave up on you because he was totally and permanently disabled just suffered from the brutality and malnutrition he had malaria very very dysentery, just a list of ailments that just followed him through the rest of his life. James had a friend in the camp who didn't give up on it. A friend passed the death house and saw him and asked a Japanese guard if they would let him take care of my husband, Jim, and said, that way you won't have to bother with him at all. I'll just sort of check on him every once in a while. And they said, yes. So he kind of stole food out of the kitchen. He was able to do that and he would take him extra portions of rice or whatever. And he was really responsible for his being able to come back home. He just saved his life. Thanks to that friend, Jim came home to Ruth. We never forgot it. I kept in touch with that guy. His name was Oki Pack. And I kept in touch with him as long as he lived. We were very, very good friends. Jim and Ruth married. They built a life together, children, grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren. He passed away too soon. In 1997, Tuda is the executive director, Harvard. She's a Harvard graduate, and she organized the Rosies in West Virginia. So I was called and asked if I worked in a defense plant during World War II. And I said, yes. So she said, we want you. So I, I, I joined the movement then, and, and then we started working together as Rosies. Ruth was even part of a documentary. It is uh, the women that went to all different parts of the United States and worked in defense plants and their stories. And they tell uh, how hard it was for them to leave their homes and get transportation to where they worked. And, just their total story, but it's a very, very good documentary. 
and it is now being shown throughout the United States. She is proud of her work. One of the things that told me that this was a very, very coveted includes her great granddaughter. There's an opportunity for her to make a difference and to make an impact on the world because there's a, a lot of opportunities out there and and she's a going to be a very intelligent young lady and she's going to be able to make choices and I want her to make the right choices and know that she's very important. We can learn a lot from Ruth. We just have to keep up with her. I've had a wonderful life. I have just, uh, I've done so many things that I never thought I would be able to do and uh, I'm just, uh, I'm going to quit at that, but I do want to point out, folks, that um, the very, very um, important issues that most people don't talk about who are doing work with roses are how much they contributed to um, essentially the um, nurturing of veterans who came back. She's an excellent example, but there are many, many others. Also, you see that Ruth um, had to be the breadwinner. Ruth raised herself up from being um, essentially a factory worker, lost her job, to um, being head of all business education for the state of West Virginia. Her husband was unable to work even as a janitor. He just was too um, depressed and disabled. Um, and then finally, something that most people don't recognize is how much hope she shows. We have a whole project of um, uh, essentially installing bluebird nest boxes because bluebirds represented hope through World War II. So the second thing then and that you've done now is Operation Confidence uh, has done is um, interview the Rosies. And that's very, very important to us and it's important to the women, and I believe it's important to the future of our country. What you've also already done is you become visible and informed participants over and over, including this evening. You are making yourself visible as being informed about the American Mercy Movement. So uh, that's super important to us because we've done more than 22 projects now uh, including naming interstate bridges and naming the first government building in America and so forth. But um, by and large, the nation doesn't yet know about it. Although it happens, it's not fast enough. Um, now, let's talk about the goal of the American Rosie Movement. What we want to do is apply what we learned about Rosie's um, to um, the problems of today. So in other words, how can we unify and face our problems uh, of today for the future? So this is not just about history. This is about doing projects together as you all are doing, and it's making you a leader in the American Rising Movement. Um, also, um, I think we need to point out how um, how we're similar to each other, how Thanks Plan and Simple and Operation Confidence are similar. Um, we're both committed to the needs of veterans, which is very clear. Um, we're both committed to applying what veterans and their supporters um, have learned uh, to be a better America or to improve America. I'm very sure uh, that what, what veterans have learned and their supporters are learning uh, with us uh, will essentially lead to action uh, that we, we essentially will be doing larger and larger projects together. The small projects will come together into a huge project, which will be called the American Rosie Movement, um, and that people will know about it. It's already called that, but people uh, around the country don't yet know about it. Um, and the most important thing is that we're taking action together that uh, builds and doesn't blame. You're, you're getting ready to uh, build a whole community there. And um, that's a very, very good example of you're not fighting 
um, amongst yourselves. You're not fighting other groups. Um, you're basically saying, let's build and not blame. And you're, you're by doing that, you're uniting and not dividing. And that's what really makes us more, uh, more tied to you than we probably would have been to um, had, had you not really shown the level of interest that you've shown and what we're doing and doing it in such a wonderful time. Um, so we need to find new ways to pull together and highest quality work in a spirit of cooperation. And the reason is because we have the freedom to. This is very, very, very important to me and to the organization. Um, I am now going to be interviewed on Thursday about my own story. And I uh, will start that story with a promise that I made to my grandmother when I was six, the day before, the day I started to school, which was the day after the uh, Japanese capit capit capitulated. Um, in other words, um, on the USS Missouri, they formally um, basically um, signed the agreement that the war was over. And that very next day I started to school and my grandmother took me to the gate and said to me, and you're a very lucky girl. You're going to grow up in a free world. You will get an education like women have never been able to do before. And I want you to promise me that you will not waste your freedom. And I promised her that I would not. And that is very, very serious to me today. And I think you all are catching on to that and understanding where I'm coming from as a person and why I've not been paid over these 14 years because I so believe that I need to keep that promise. So some of the common goals between all of us are, um, we want to improve respect for veterans, for women's contributions, for people's potential, regardless of race, age, and other differences. Um, and we uh, want to improve respect uh, for the fact that we can prove that people can come together and unite. Um, to um, go on to, um, uh, you, you've interviewed the Rosies, you've gotten public awareness, you've gotten the public informed, and now we're ready to start working with you all to figure out how we're gonna raise funds at a very much larger level than we've done uh, before together. Some examples of what you might do now um, are, um, we have, we're thinking about making this our logo. So you have the Rosie there with her arm in the air, but you have um, a gray haired lady, a child, and that has quite a history behind it. That, that um, poster was designed by the Freedom Museum in the Netherlands. But the thing that's missing in it to me is we need a veteran. So if you all have any ideas on how to add or adapt uh, this, uh, we had, a, uh, excuse me, we have an artist who's working on it now, but I told her to stop on it because um, we basically need to add a veteran in there. And by the way, this lady here with the grayish hair, she's, uh, she's from the Netherlands. And they are extremely, extremely grateful to America even today because they were not able to even fight back for their freedom. They were occupied. And there are so many stories. Um, books could be written from what I know of the people there and how much they really love um, the Roses. And they also know that we understand their, their stories of being occupied when some people think that um, they were complicit with the uh, Germans. Well, if they were complicit, it was because they didn't have the freedom not to be. So to be held down is really, really more difficult, I believe, than fighting back, although neither of them are pleasant situations for sure. So in addition to doing, uh, helping us uh, to try to figure out if we want to change our uh, logo and put a veteran in there, uh, you might want to build a Rosie Park. This park was the first and the only park ever designed by Rosies. It's in a small town of St. Albans, West Virginia. 
the women, uh, there were 14 women who chose the spot. It should make a movie. It is an extremely interesting story of how the park commission did not want to give this land to the Rosies. And uh, it's a park within a park. We chose that so it wouldn't have to be maintained by us and be, be maintained by the park. But they didn't want to save this piece of land and how the women manipulated and um, essentially just got smart and outsmarted them and got that, that uh, park is wonderful. But that oval represents democracy. The oval office represents democracy. So an oval is very important to us as well. Or you might grow a victory garden in the space that you have. Um, by the way, this artwork done here is um, the same artist who is um, helping us to design a new logo if we decide we want to do that. But the other thing, and this is what's most important to all of us, is that we can put all these small projects together and ask for the whole thing. We need to reach your all's dream of a well-managed community for homeless veterans. It can have different steps, but all the time, we need to all be working together for something bigger. It's not easy. I can tell you that I've worked now for 14 years to get people to understand that we are asking people to do a piece of a project and you put all the pieces together and the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And we're just about to the place now where people are putting these pieces together and saying, oh my goodness, if I help and don't compete with Thanks Plan and Simple and the American Rosie Movement, I'm going to be part of something bigger. And we're just beginning to get that message out. I want to summarize if I have time. Do I have time, Consuela? Yeah, you got a couple, well, a couple, one or two more minutes. Okay. So to summarize, um, this is what we have found that people need in order to pull together. Uh, they need a reason, something that, I can agree, that they can all agree on that should be done. Um, it can't be argumentative at all. Well, I will tell you that people agree that the Rosies should be respected and that we should follow in their footsteps. So um, also people need to see others doing something. So people don't want to be the first to do something that's too much heavy lifting, too many unknowns, and they're very uncomfortable. Well, we've spent 14 years um, proving that people can do something and office and confidence has helped with that. Uh, people need to know they'll be guided. So this is where you and I, your, or your, your group and our group uh, is at this point. We need to know that when we uh, ask people to come in to help us, that they won't just wander about and uh, not be guided on, on what to do. Uh, they also need, people also need to know uh, that they can get credit for what they do. This is a constant problem. If you've got people doing Rosie projects all over the country and you ask them to join you, they think you want to be top dog and they don't understand that they're extremely important in the whole mix. So um, uh, essentially people need to get credit. We need to make sure that people know they're gonna get credit for their own work. Um, and people, uh, want to know that they can be part of something bigger. Um, remember that every project should be sassy. I love this, the kids love it, the teachers love it. And uh, so no matter what projects we do, whether big or small or comb combination of projects, they have to be sustainable. You don't wanna start something that's gonna look bad in five years. They have to be achievable. You don't wanna start something that you can't finish and um, essentially um, have it be an example of poor, poor unity rather than good unity. It has to be a simple statement of what the Rosies are about, which is to pull together and do high quality work in a spirit of cooperation. And it has to involve youth. We assume that um, this includes veterans and we don't even put veterans in there because it is so implicit. There's a lot of miscellaneous things that I could show you if you wanted to see them, but we're out of time. So, um, yeah, we can always yeah. come back with yeah. the second part, but this has been quite informative. I hope everyone out there and 
and uh, radio and and TV and and internet land was able to enjoy this. You know, this is and I, I I appreciate all of you. I I will just let me repeat that one of the things I most love about Operation Confidence is that you are a variety of people. You have veterans who have really, really uh, overcome extremely difficult circumstances in your life. I was, I was homeless myself and I understand this. And I, I feel a great identity to this group, not because I feel sorry for veterans, but because I know that veterans have been serving this country and still want to serve. They just want people to make room for them to be able to do that. And right. That's a huge commonality in who I am and who you all are. And thank you very much. Well, and before you close out, can you give contact information of how to reach yes. you? Yes. Uh, yeah. The um, website. The website is American Rosie R O S I E Movement M O V E M E N T dot org. The uh, email is team T E A M at American Rosie Movement dot org. Telephone number 304-776-4743. And um, the other small piece that's probably important is that we have model communities all over the country. And we hope that uh, Los Angeles will be a model community in 2013. Great. Can you give your phone number one more time before we move on? 304-776. 4743. That's a West Virginia number. I came back from Boston after being gone for, I think, something like 40 years okay. um, to, to do this project from a state where I knew I could work quietly and not have a lot of political pressures. Right. And it's taken longer than we wanted, but we're here, we're where we wanted to be. Okay. Well, you know, this is being recorded and we'll be able to send you the link on how to share this with your board and, and, and i surely yeah. thank you and thank you um, okay moving right along here you give us give us our screen back <laughs> i'm trying to okay just go up to yeah go up to the top versus connie do you want to make me a co-host too while you if you can sure as soon as i can get the screen okay there we go okay all right, so um, our next speaker is girlfriend Martha. Martha, take it, girl. Okay, Veterans Day originated as Armistice Day on November 11th, 1919, and was the first anniversary of the end of World War I. Congress passed a resolution in 1926 for an annual observation. Obser or annual observance, and November 11th became a national holiday beginning in 1938. Unlike Memorial Day, Veterans Day pays tribute to all American veterans living or dead, but especially gives thanks to all veterans who served their country honorably during war or peacetime. Now, I'd like to share a little bit of information about a, a female veteran, a Paralympian, Angela Madison. Um, who was a solo, was a rowing, uh, a rower, um, and a very active uh, women veteran in the Southern California communities. So she had set out, uh, again, she was a three-time Paralympian rower. Um, unfortunately, Angela Madsen was found dead after attempting to become the first paraplegic athlete to row across the Pacific Ocean. She was 60 years old. Madsen had dreams of being the first paraplegic, openly gay athlete and the oldest woman to cross the Pacific Ocean, according to the Long Beach Press Telegram. So in April, she left Marina Del Rey in Los Angeles on a 20 foot rowboat heading towards Honolulu, Hawaii. She reportedly journeyed alone, bringing only food, uh, water, and supplies with her. Madsen's wife, Deb, said on Facebook she became worried when Madsen stopped responding to her text messages on Sunday. When, she checked, when I checked the main message inbox, she had not returned any messages. When I looked at the tracking, it did not appear that she was rowing the boat, but rather that it was drifting. 
Madsen's body was discovered the next day by the U.S. Coast Guard. An official cause of death had not yet been determined. Madsen, who was also a U.S. Marine veteran, became paralyzed in 1993 when things went wrong after a surgery on her injured spine that she had suffered during a basketball game at the Marine Corps Air Station El Toro. She later became homeless, which she blamed on the massive medical bills that followed, but she later found wheelchair sports and it changed her life. Madsen earned a spot on the U.S. Paralympic team three times, winning the bronze medal in the shot put in 2012. Um, Angela Madsen was also a very active member of the PVA and has had worked with a lot of the women veterans uh, in the Long Beach VA uh, community. So I wanted who, to share- Martha, who is yeah. the PVA? The Paralyzed Veterans of America, California chapter. So PVA. There you go. So she's well known in Long Beach. She's well known in the veteran community and, and, and has a lot of respect from all of the work she's done, not just her, her uh, more well-noted you know, athletic um, involvement and her involvement with um, the, the community in general. So I wanted to talk a little bit about an upcoming event and it's happening next weekend and I'll go ahead and share my screen if, if I'm able to do so. Oops, let's see what happened here. Okay. Um, can I share my screen? Let's see here. You okay. should be able to. Yep. Let's see. Tell me if you guys can see it. Yes. Yeah, there we okay. go. All right. So next weekend, uh, Angel City Sports Foundation, which most of you probably have heard of before, they're having what's called Courage Weekend. It takes place next Saturday, November 19th through Sunday, November 20th. So it's a two-day event, starts at 10 a.m. on Saturday um, at Cerritos College, which is 111110. Those are my angel numbers. Alondra Boulevard in Norwalk, California. At So kind of show you a little map there um, of where the college is at. And Angel City Sports uh, Courage Weekend will include a day of uh, competitive sports on Saturday. So there'll be some wheelchair basketball, some wheelchair football, sitting volleyball. Um, there's also a, some golf activities, fitness and yoga. If you're not so much into the competitive side of the events, there will be some more fitness related events. So again, like the yoga and um, bowling kind of looks like a fun, it's going to be a fun weekend. Um, and you see there's some big sponsors involved. So Fox Sports will be one of the big sponsors. And then our buddy, Nico Maralongo, I hope I'm not saying his name too terribly wrong, um, is all, with Operation Rebound will also be one of the big sponsors. So the, the VPAN, the Military Veterans Affairs, VOA, I, I don't know what some of those other, oh, uh, the DAV, and again, the PVA will be involved. Um, and so from 10 to 4, you can participate in some of these fun events at Cerritos College, but then the dinner event starts at 5 p.m. And the dinner event will honor uh, Angela Madsen and her, um, you know, her work that she's done in the veteran community. So there'll be some um, awards and they're also gonna honor another Paralympian, a, a male veteran. I, I believe he's a Navy veteran um, on Saturday. So I thought I had a different flyer up, but that's okay. And then on Sunday, all of the events will shift to the Compton Hunting and Fishing Club, which then begins on um, at nine o'clock on Sunday. And that those games will include the archery, air, air rifle, golf, rowing challenge and lawn games. So less com competitive style uh, activities on Saturday, on Sunday at, at the Compton hum Hunting and Fishing Club. Um, so if you're more into those style of events, those will be going on on Sunday. Lunch will also be included on, on both days, and I believe there'll be some food trucks pulling up um, to feed the group. 
So if anyone is interested or knows any veterans that are interested, please pass the word along. Um, you can go to Eventbrite and Google Courage Weekend um, or Angel City Sports Foundation as the registration links will be available on either sites. So the, the PVACC will be in attendance um, next weekend. We will have a booth that'll be there uh, just to kind of hang out and answer questions for any veterans who are interested in learning more about what we have to offer at PVACC, as well as some of our board members who are a little bit more competitive will be involved in some of the activities Saturday and Sunday. Um, and so I've also invited Consuela to join me at the dinner um, in honor I'll of Angela Madsen. So that'll be kind of fun. And this is also like we're just starting to get back into the swing of things as well. So last weekend we participated in a smaller event uh, with the Triumph Foundation. And so this will be our third event because actually yesterday, or I'm sorry, Friday, we were down at the uh, Newport Beach American Legion. So we're really excited um, to try to get out and participate in a, in a wonderful weekend with some awesome veterans. And so we're, oh, and let me for, forget not to mention it's also in honor of first responders and uh, the focus is on disability. So there'll be some folks, some first responders who um, who also are a part of that um, community as well. So we're really excited about that. I see there's a, oh, and then also if you need some help, financial help and assistance with travel and or um, accommodations, you can reach out to the Challenged Athletes uh, Foundation because they will be helping offset the cost. So Richard. Yeah, I Richard should be involved in that. Are you Thanks, going, Richard? Richard? I'm going to it. Yes, I am. Awesome. Well, then we'll see you out there. Um, okay. Spread the word, Richard, because I know that the uh, registration was kind of low last week. And, 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 you know, and it's to be un understood, you know, COVID is still rearing its ugly head. People yeah. are still getting sick, right? I, my, my roommate back home um, came down with COVID a couple weeks ago. So just when you think that it's over. Unfortunately, um, it's not. So, right. you know, if uh, folks are interested, you know, let them know that there is some some assistance to help offset the costs of travel or that sort of thing. So pass the word along, folks. And Taylor, I know you work with a lot of uh, folks, so I could send this over to you if you know of anybody who might be interested in, in uh, coming out to participate. So, yeah. and I think like, you know, I'll say kind of one last thing about this, because I've been part of the, the meetings that have been um, occurring, just, you know, the planning meetings and, you know, trying to really um, make this a well attended event. And, you know, it was really sad that their executive director had, you know, wrote sort of a, um, a piece about how difficult it is to get women, get uh, veterans involved. And how, you know, there's such a, you know, low turnout of, in terms of numbers when it comes to veteran participation. And so we really want to try to help, you know, do what we can to spread the word and make sure that as many veterans as we know are aware of, you know, this wonderful event. Again, it's free of charge. There's food provided pretty much all weekend. Um, and then the dinner um, Saturday to honor Angela Madsen. So that's kind of why I got involved. And again, just really looking to spread the word to as many veteran organizations that I can to help make sure that these guys fulfill their mission and really making sure that veterans are a part of this wonderful event. So I wanted to share that with you guys. Okay, that's great information. I'll be, I'll be there. I'd awesome. Like to, I'd like to let our viewers and listeners know that PBA has also been involved Operation Confidence, and here recently we had an event with the Kansas City Chief Frank Clark, where we had hosted a inner city kids, uh, what is that, football game, and PBA was, had, we allowed them to collaborate with us, so it was a good thing, and I'm happy to have PBA on board, and I thank you so much, Mark, I just want to bring that to everyone's attention that we have worked, and still is working with PBA as well. Okay, so yes. great. We're moving right along here. Uh, you know, ironically, you had just mentioned about uh, COVID is still raising its ugly head. And our guest today was was Greg, uh, I'm sorry, Gary Am, 
Lay, who wanted to talk about his father, who was captain of the U.S. Army, and he's on his way to the hospital because his wife was, has just was diagnosed with cancer and COVID. So we're going to see a little, hopefully, you know, blessing for her. And at the same time, Martha, you or Taylor, would you please read about his father, Donald yeah. Omley? If I'm not pronouncing yeah. it right, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, this was from Donald, or uh, Gray Omley. My father, Donald Omley, Captain U.S. Air Force. On January 19, I mean, excuse me, on January 9, 1933 through September 17, 2020, my father, Don Imley, longtime resident of Lake Balboa, passed away on September 17, 2020, at the age of 87, with family and friends by his side. Don was born in San Diego and his father's birthday, or on his father's birthday of January 9th, 1933, son of R.W. Curtis Omley and Dorothy Conrad Omley. Later in 1933, sister Miriam Omley Phillips was born. Brother Robert was born a few years later. In the early 40s, he witnessed wartime prep at the San Diego Navy base and the post-war boom. At Point Loma High School, he played trombone and marching band, joined ROTC, and enjoyed social activities. Working at his parents' drive-in restaurant from age 12, he earned money to purchase his first car, a Buick, starting his love affair with driving and his famous obsession with detailing his cars. While earning his bachelor's in business at San Diego State, he met Carol Ruth Hanna, at a fraternity party launching a romantic or launching a romance that led to marriage in 1954 and continued until Carol passing in 2018. As soon thereafter, he served as lieutenant in the Air Force, which moved the young couple to Moses Lake, Washington, where their son Gregory Curtis was born in 1956. After promotion to captain, Don left the service in 1957 and started his business career selling technology to businesses in downtown LA, tech then adding machines from Victor Machines. The couple had their second son, Stuart Fred, in 1960. Don then landed at Security First National Bank as assistant branch manager in Brentwood. Security First soon became Security Pacific, and Don soon became a trust administrator, managing other people's business, as he often said. Among his clients were the old money of Southern California, including Doris Day, one of his favorite performers. Don finished his banking career with Bank of America, retiring in 1998, and then participated in YMCA, YMCA Indian Guides with, the bo with both boys. He helped them with fishing, baseball, camping, and math. A big believer in giving back, Don helped, held leadership roles at Panorama Presbyterian Church, Junior Chamber of Commerce, the Selective Service System Board, and later with Iwanis in Hollywood, Pasadena, and Calabasas. Post-retirement, he continued his love of music making by singing in the church choir. His Malif Lewis, Bar baritone can still be heard in the voice of his surviving son, him. Greg invited friends and family members to attend the memorial service on November 7, 2020, that took place at 2 p.m. via Zoom with Panorama Presbyterian Church. In lieu of flowers, the family invited contributions um, to the Alzheimer's Association in honor of Don beloved Carol. Thank you. Okay, and uh, I had the privilege of meeting uh, Gregory several years ago when he followed his father's profession and it was an executive uh, banker at uh, City National. So he and I have become very good friends and my heart goes out to his uh, uh, loved one that's now suffering from cancer and COVID. 
So we want to throw out a prayer for him and hope he gets she gets better as well. Okay, so we're going to move on here. We have a our next amazing guest would be Richard. Richard's going to tell us some things about his experience uh, in the military and at the, after that, uh, having three strokes. So go ahead on, Richard. Let everyone know who you are and what, what you have to share today. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, also, I'm going to start this way, no disrespect, but I have vision problems and also speaking problems. And that speaking problem is called aphasia. So I'm speaking the best way I can. Let me, kind of grade me, let me know. because I, No I one would have never known. You speak I very try to get, well. I try to get better. So thank you very much. Anyways, vision problems also are contributed to what I've gone through. But I spent over 33 years in the Army and then seven years working for the Veterans Administration I was a chief of payroll before everything has transpired from the strokes, but my strokes were a cause a little bit differently than other people have experienced. So I'm going to say this, my strokes was caused because I had a tumor stuck in my heart artery. So that's what kind of transpired. And that's when the strokes happened. I had a major stroke. Then the worst one was a, a massive stroke. Most people pass away from massive strokes. I still survived, but the massive stroke was so problem causing that I was weak on my left side for a long time. Now, for example, I'm gonna show you this way because I've been working this part out. I can do this now. I couldn't do that in 2016. So I can do all Is that this. Your weak, the weak hand, weak side? That's the weak, that's the weak side right here. Oh, that's side. amazing, okay. Demonstrated at the VA hospital for the Creative Arts Festival, I was demonstrating where the weak side, I was doing uh, left side push-ups. So I just, you know, I had my right hand behind me while I was doing left side push-ups. So they were pretty much amazed about that. So the thing is also, let me say this, in December, they're gonna release on a, I, I call it like a newsletter, but it's kind of an upgrade semi-magazine. Uh, they're going to release uh, my story, which I'm shortening down right now, in December. So I'll have a copy of that as well, too. I'll try to see if I get enough copy for all of yourselves uh, for that. But the things I've gone through and learned from the strokes, causation of strokes, and all the people of therapists is you have to always monitor your cholesterol. Why? Because the tumor that was heart stuck in my heart that they had to clean out and clear out uh, was a tumor with so much cholesterol in it that, 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 that that's why they told me from now on, you start to do this, do this, which other areas of medications. I currently monitoring my cholesterol. I have to take a cholesterol, I'm gonna call it in a better way, a cholesterol buster, which means it's an injection I give myself uh, every two weeks. So this coming Thursday, is my uh, second injection because I did mine earlier in the month. Uh, so, uh, but you have to monitor your cholesterol. See how your cholesterol is uh, standing in, in the negative or the positive, which means if you're still extremely with a lot of cholesterol in there, find out from your doctors what it takes to be able to lower your cholesterol. Don't, don't put it in a way that you say, oh, I'll, I'll take care of it later. No because you could end up with a stroke because of the cholesterol blocking your blood flow. Number two, if you have diabetes, if you have diabetes, believe me, check on that as well too, because a lot of strokes also are caused by conditions from diabetes because of the, of the areas that it's affecting besides all the other areas, it could still cause you to have a stroke because of what's going on. And then also check your high blood pressure. That's very important because if your blood pressure keeps monitoring to be high, believe me, just like myself, I didn't know what was going on in 2016. 
And because the doctors at the veterans hospital would always check me and say, why is your blood pressure so high? Don't take a chance. Find out what you can do to lower your high blood pressure to be in the right spectrum because then you will not have a stroke. I'm just saying that in that way. But then don't stop there. Start eating healthy. Whatever you're going through, whatever, I'm, I'm going to put it this way, no disrespect respects to anybody because I have a Latino background. The thing is, the tamales, all that, um, menudo, I grew up on that. The thing is, I had to stop all that and start eating healthy. Because right. There is what they call a stroke belt. It comes all the way through West Virginia. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying that's the description of the stroke belt all the way through uh, Texas, all the way up to Los Angeles area. All those are where people start eating what they grew up on. And that's called the stroke belt because they're all eating things that are not healthy and appropriate. So that's why strokes will happen. And that's what's known as a stroke belt. So the thing is, uh, also in that area, when I did this, that's neuroplasticity. I can't say very good, but it's because my, my speech is still getting worked on. Where you can't do that, where you can't do uh, push-ups, the neurons in the brain have been damaged. So the brain has brain damage, but what they have to do is you have to work on it to find new pathways so that way you can start being rebuilt. So technically, I have, along with the veteran staff, the doctors, I have I, I have to have an appointment coming up very soon where I have to go there and see the, uh, the uh, sorry, I have to get the word out because uh, the brain still takes some time to recycle. I have to see the stroke doctor again uh, coming very soon. So I'm, I'm going to see the stroke doctor. But the point is, uh, the neurons have to find new pathways because the brain, those previous pathways are damaged and gone. So the things, the new pathways is what I, what I was able to do through all the exercises I'm doing. And then I can get things to where uh, I can do things physically. So for example, I did things physically with the Golden Age Games. I took fourth place as a senior at my age for 65, uh, where I took fourth place in the 1500 meter power walk. Now that's a one mile walking, but it's still like speed walking. But the thing is I took fourth place where physically I couldn't do that before. Then I also took for the horseshoe side uh, for being visually impaired. I took uh, the uh, bronze medal for hitting the most horseshoes in that side. And then also exercise. Now everybody knows I've been exercising. Believe me, I'm exercising. And my one of my better levels of exercises, about every three days to four days, I end up walking a lot. Now everybody knows how, how long I've been walking? Does it know if I know? Well, let me say this. I've done 15 miles to 16 miles. Now, my next goal to meet work that level is I plan to get to 26.5 miles. That's a little like a marathon, but I'm doing that to show physically how I'm able to overcome what I've done from these strokes. All these three strokes caused me a lot of physical and also mental, uh, which I'm leading to cognitivity where I couldn't say that before in 2016, like say cognitivity. So the cognitive side caused a lot of brain damage, uh, also speaking, which is aphasia. So all that at that aspects right there. And some of you can see the photos I'm doing because I hey have vision me. loss from the strokes. So one of the, of the third stroke, I believe what it was, affected my brain somewhere, caused me vision loss. So I can do those. But I didn't quit. Now I'm gonna say this because also people when they when they when they have affected by this, they end up suicide. So I'm just saying this to other veterans who are listening to this. Don't do anything hastily. 
you can recover by still doing everything I'm, I'm saying here. What's the most compatible sign for Aquarius? Someone has some What's feedback that is so a phone. Maybe he's I mean, it's a good Okay. Sorry? There was some feedback. So you couldn't okay. hear everything that you were saying. Okay. So what, 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 what was the last part? <laughs> uh, you tell us about your, your, your site and different things. Yeah, my, my site from one of the strokes, I believe it was the third stroke because that happened right after the massive stroke caused me vision loss. So the thing is vision loss, I had to still tailor my photography because I was a photographer before I was a photographer in the army taking the pictures of the various ceremonies that was on base. So I was a good photographer. But the thing is the one of the strokes caused me vision loss but I had to find a new way, a new way. People give up and that's where suicide, a lot of veterans get so depressed that they don't want to live anymore. I'm encouraging all veterans of any types of injuries to never give up. Don't quit, don't give up because I continue doing my photography even post strokes to where I still do the photography and I'm still waiting from the VA because of what we just did find out what level I end up coming into because uh, all the current photography that I've done is at the VA in Washington. So I'm just waiting word and how I stood out with which one won or which one didn't win. I'll just find out like that. But also did my essay like I'm doing right now where I had done that at the West LA VA. They were very impressed about that. And I'll still find out how I rank in that aspects as well too. So anyways, but always look at everything to make sure you're staying in regards to the neuroplasticity on doing your exercises and also monitoring your cholesterol, diabetes, and blood pressure. And also by doing that, that brings you back to eating healthy. Eat everything in a healthy manner. Uh, and I still cheat a little bit, I'll be honest. I still cheat, but not so bad as before. That's why they have told me, they just sent me my paper from the VA doctor that my cholesterol is now normal. So All right. There you go. Listen, before you. you move on, uh, I want to ask you, uh, did this all start your strokes and your suffering started uh, while you were in the military? Oh, how did I believe so. I believe so. I think before I mentioned this, Meals ready to eat was what they gave us for our lunchtime, sometimes dinner as well, too, which meals ready to eat back in 2000. They were still building up everything for your energy because they want you to have those. But the thing is, I found out that they had high cholesterol in their food product because they're like little Lunchables, but they're packaged. The thing is, by eating those, that builds up your your cholesterol and also make yourself borderline diabetes and cause your high blood pressure. So they always in the army side, check me. And they also said the same question, but they never gave me any statin because I found out from one of the doctors for strokes, the army didn't have any statins back then. They only had started statins now currently for people who had various areas for high cholesterol. So I've been taking my statins, and then that stroke, I call it uh, cholesterol buster, uh, which is an uh, injection. It's like an EpiPen. I forgot what they called in the Army when we used to give those, those injections to ourselves that we come in contact with something biological or radiological, uh, but we used to give that. So it's very similar to that type of EpiPen. And so I give my shot every two weeks to lower the cholesterol. All right. Okay, well, thank you. That was some amazing information. And do you, uh, well, first of all, you forgot to tell everyone that you have this, your book's coming out. One of them is already at, on, Amazon, on Amazon, right? You have another one coming out, right? Yeah, um, the one on, Amazon, one on Amazon currently right now is I once was whole because I'll still bits and pieces from the strokes. The newer one is it's not a race, it's a journey. And why that one's written is because it will take various time 
for you to build yourself up, go through all the processes, pretty much outlining for what everything I had just said, because it will take some time. So it's not something you get frustrated with and run into. The thing is, just take your time, right. be calm, and do everything very calmly. Like when I, I do my photography and something I've seen, uh, the thing is, I do it in a calm fashion, take the photo, work on what I'm doing to make it a little bit more artistic, artistic, uh, because that's my therapy to be calm and have that done and produced. Okay, well, thank you so much. And I'm quite sure all of our viewers are wondering why is this robust man sitting here with these flowers behind him? <laughs> would you, yeah, would you that, tell us why? That's your artwork. That, that's one of my artworks right there. I've got that's others beautiful. coming out. And the thing is, uh, that's just one of them, but I have others as well too in the future. I'll, right, I'll show right. You, those. you have them on display at several veterans' events and also at uh, Laura's. Uh, uh, what was that? Her options. That's the options yeah. that she. Options and that she I will tell you this much: depending how I place from the veterans' ministries back in Washington, how I place in regards to which one is something that has impressed them to win, I will send that. Once it's done, they say, okay, uh, it's yours now. I will donate that to Operation Confidence. Oh, and also, you. Uh, you can let her know that I'll be bringing that by. So that way, you know, hopefully it kind of brings more people who would like to buy it. Thank you so much. We always have so happy to have you on the show and you always have informative Thank information. Thank you so much. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, we're going to move right along here. Um, we want uh, Taylor to tell us a little bit about uh, her friend, Maggie. So I was, I was, uh, it was a random day for my friend Maggie, who is a U.S. Army veteran and her two sons. They were relaxing in their living room watching TV when her 10 year old asked if she can get um, get some water. She looked at her son, sprawled out lazily on the floor and said, hey, you've got two perfectly good legs. You know where the refrigerator is, where the cups are, and how to use the water dispenser. The groaning and whining boy dragged himself to his feet and headed towards the kitchen. Having to raise two kids with any kind of disability, whether mentally or physically, makes an already tough job even tougher. Maggie had both her sons after she returned from the army as a paralyzed veteran. Fortunately, both of her pregnancies and deliveries were completely normal. Wheelchair moms can do more for their kids than you could possibly imagine, but it would be foolish not to acknowledge that they have some limitations. Fortunately, Maggie was able to do everything a mother with a disability could do for her kids when they were babies. Because of her military training, she was able to get around well enough and could haul her baby's carriers to and from the car, carry them safely around the house, take them to Jamboree the and the library without much help. At that point, she didn't feel she was missing out on much. You have no idea how incredibly useful this was for her. On one occasion, it was pouring rain on a day I had to take uh, on a day uh, she had to take the kids to gymnastics. As you can imagine, using a walker and an umbrella at the same time isn't the easiest thing in the world. So I sat on him or I sat him on the walker and gave him the umbrella to hold and attempt to cover us both. And we were on our way giggling and laughing because what else can you do? But one of the greatest joys in this journey was when Maggie got a scooter. She told the boys she wanted to go for a walk. For over an hour, she just followed behind them, traveling in the neighborhood for the first time in the three and a half years she had been living there. She laughed when the boys would stop to look at a bug on the ground, enjoy the smells of all the fir trees and flowers, and freak out whenever a bee came too close to them. Just doing something so simple and common and uneventful brought her so much joy that day that it was all she could do to not start sobbing with happiness in front of her kids. Oh, that's so precious. 
So, I mean, that's just to let you know, just because you have a disability, you may be in a wheelchair. That doesn't mean that you can't raise kids and raise them well. Thank you so much for that information, Taylor. Uh, Martha, you're coming on down to the wire, girlfriend. You want to tell us about the Marine Corps? Yes, I will talk a little bit about the Marine Corps. When was the Marine Corps, when did the Marine Corps begin? On November 10th, 19, oh, I'm sorry, on November 10th, 1775, the Marine Corps' annual tradition celebrates the establishment of the organization by the Second Continental Congress. The birthday, also known as Marine Corps Day, was originally celebrated on July 11th from, from 1799 until 1921 when Major General Lejeune issued an order to formalize the tradition and traditionally, oh, and establish the official day to honor the birthday of the Marine Corps. The ceremony traditionally includes a guest of honor uh, at the reading oh, and a reading of the general. On November 10th, 2022, Marines across the globe recognize and acknowledge 247 years of service to their country, the sacrifices made to defend democracy and the Marine Corps' enduring legacy as America's premier fighting force. The Marine Corps' annual tradition celebrates the establishment of the organization on November 10th by the Second Continental Congress. Following their role in the American Revolution, the Marines were, ab were abolished following the Treaty of Paris in April of 1783. Then on July 11th, 1798, Congress ordered the creation of the Marine Corps and directed that it be available for service under the Secretary of the Navy. The birthday, also known as Marine Corps Day, was established um, to Oh, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a repeat. When the first cake ceremony, uh, when, while the first cake ceremony is unknown, the first on record took place at the Marine Barracks in Washington, D.C. in 1937. Major General Thomas Holcomb, the, the commandant, presided at an open house for Marine Corps officers, including the cake, the cutting of a huge cake in the shape of Tun Tavern, the birthplace of the corpse. As the evolution of war fighting becomes our reality, it will still be the Marines who defend this nation. So that's a quote from General Berger, who was the command commandant of the Marine Corps. In this year's annual message, the commandant of the Marine Corps, General David H. Berger and Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Tony, Troy Black, pay tribute to the men and women who joined following September 11th of 20, 2001. These Marines were called to service as an elite counterinsurgency force and made great contributions in the deserts of Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and Northern Africa. As we mark the 21st anniversary of those who fought the war on terror and are now retiring, we want them to know that we appreciate their courage, their sacrifice, and their valor that they showed during this conflict said General Berger. Berger. The, ne the next generation of Marines may operate diff differently and in different places than the Marines who wear the eagle, globe, and anchor today. Yet they will join a long and proud heritage of Marine fighters who have never turned from a threat or an enemy. We will always remain most ready when our nation is least ready because we must protect our shores and our citizens. And as the next evolution of war fighting becomes our reality, it will still be the Marines who defend this nation. Okay, thank you. That was some good information because we wanted to acknowledge our Marines as well. We just had a birthday. So, okay, well, we're closing out, guys. It was a great show. Uh, we want to uh, also, once again, uh, acknowledge and have prayer I mean, our heads down for our, our good buddy Charles. I know he's going through a, a heartbreak right now with this mom. And um, to uh, Gregory regarding his uh, his loved one as well, going having dealing with COVID and cancer. These are two very, very heartbreaking things that are happening right now. 
So anyway, Taylor, have you start closing this out? Martha, you fill in, and then we're going to say goodbye. Okay. Before Miss Connie closes the show, I would like to remind our viewers and listeners about our amazing advertisement rate. We have 20 and 30 second advertisement slots available. Please email info at operationconfidence.org. Again, info at operationconfidence.org. For more information and visit Operation Confidence's website at www.operationconfidence.org. Um, click on resource page for some amazing resources. I would also like to inform our viewers and listeners about Amazon Smell. When making your next purchase on Amazon, please go to Amazon Smell, type in Operation Confidence in the Choose Your Organization donation box. Amazon will make a small donation to Operation Confidence. And to get involved in Operation Confidence Tiny Houses Project, please visit our website and send us a message on how you would like to be involved. All right. To our viewers and listeners, we would like to inform you about Operation Confidence Positive, Re Re Positive Redirection Team a group of male and female veterans who are mentors, having overcome similar challenges and situations, transitioning back into mainstream society. To be connected or become a team member, please email, email us at info at operationconfidence.org. And we are also excited to inform you about Operation Confidence's Combat Boots, Boots and Lace Women's Veterans Mentoring and Creative Arts Group. The Zoom meetings will take place on the first Saturday of the month. So if you are interested or would like to get involved, please email martha at operationconfidence.org or info at operationconfidence.org. And we will be soon announcing a new segment and program about elderly servicemen and women. Stay tuned for that. Thank you. Also, this is Richard. if you need any help on that, I don't mind because I've helped a lot of women veterans as well as women soldiers as well too, in regards to photography. Oh, that'd be great. We're gonna need you, Richard, because I'll be able to explain more about what that's all about real soon. Okay. okay, as always, we want to remind our viewers and listeners that our goal for the show is to raise awareness about Operation Confidence's mission which is to provide stable housing with a wide range of supportive services, including employment opportunities. So to get involved with our grassroots efforts, please send us an email at info at operationconference.org. Once again, info at operationconference.org. And don't forget to visit our website, www.operationconference.org. Oh, and I'd like for you to please don't forget to subscribe to our American Invisible Heroes on our own YouTube channel. And we'd like to also leave you all today by telling you that as of June the 21st, uh, we have now 80, over 80,000 views. And we're all excited and it's going up every day. So applause, applause, applause for us. And we're excited that all of you have found an interest in thinking about and wanting to hear some of the outstanding guests that we've had on the show, and especially our Rosies. I mean, those ladies are just absolutely amazing. We've had several Rosies on that have passed on, and it was just too, uh, it was just a breath of fresh air to hear how they were able to tell us the stories and take us through it, just like that video that we just seen. And I mean, they're in their 90s, damn near 100, and can tell us what happened you know what how many years ago uh and and can you hear me oh is she muted yeah she's muted they can't hear you man somebody's a better mathematician than me but um, mm -hmm. 1945 from 2022 yeah that's um, like what 77 70 some years ago 77 yeah that's amazing so anyway, uh, we also are proud to inform our viewers and our listeners that Operation Conference American Invisible Heroes broadcast on the Block 105 satellite radio. And it's a two-hour show every Saturday from 10 to 12. We're also on Spotify and soon on iHeartRadio, Apple, Google, 
podcast and radio public. So we're getting the word out. We're so excited. So thank you so much. We want to thank Ann for her amazing presentation. And of course, Richard, you know, you're on the team. And of course, you know, always with Martha and with Taylor, they've always been, those are my baby girls. <laughs> so I want to thank you so much. And we'll be back next week as always, God willingly. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Everybody. Thank Bye. You so much. Thank you again. Bye. Bye.